Oh, John, we can't hear you. There we go. Of course, you know, you would think we would know how to do that uh, by now, but um, so let me reshare my screen just to make sure I have it uh, shared correctly. Right here we go. Um, so my name is John Porter. I work with uh, Nebraska Extension, uh, and I'm very excited to be with you tonight and talk about um, uh, this subject. I think it's something that a lot of people are, are interested in. Uh, maybe a not a lot of people know everything about it. I'm trying to get this thing off of my screen, and I don't know how to do that. Uh, so we will deal with that. Um, I work with Nebraska Extension, so I'm the urban agriculture educator uh, located uh, in the Omaha area with Nebraska Extension. Uh, and in that role, I uh, teach many different topics about urban production from growing outside uh, in the garden, uh, in the field, uh, to uh, this topic, uh, which is hydroponics, aquaponics, aeroponics. Uh, and I got started in this really as a way to um, deal with issues around uh, environmental sustainability. And I know some people might have been surprised when they, they heard about um, uh, Conservation Nebraska doing a, a hydroponics workshop because some people don't equate um, hydroponics with um, with conservation because there is quite a bit of inputs that go into it. If we think about electricity, if we think about um, you know, all the equipment that you need, the, the plastic, et cetera. And so I think um, you know, there's lots of, of information that we can learn uh, about um, this technique uh, and this technology uh, that is, um, I think, um, important to think about uh, and that's what I want to start my presentation off on is, is thinking about the, the sort of conservation aspect of it uh, and why it is an, an important um, topic to think about. If we think about uh, the global population, uh, we're projected to reach uh, 10 billion people by 2050. Uh, and that's a lot of people to feed. Uh, that's a growth of 83 million more people per year. Uh, and it's an estimated that uh, each year, um, or that 124 million people uh, faced food shortages by climate-related uh, events in 2019. So if we think about even our own local climate here in Nebraska, um, I would say a great number of our um, calls that came into the extension office over last summer about things not producing well, about things not growing well, uh, were all things that had to do uh, with climate or with weather. Uh, we had uh, people calling because um, their tomatoes weren't growing or they weren't producing. They had things that weren't ripening. They had things that dried up and died in the garden. Uh, and if we think about um, even like that small inconvenience for us, if we think about larger areas where we have um, desertification going on, where, where things are getting drier and hotter, uh, and we are probably heading toward that um, there, uh, there are issues that I think we need to look at uh, and have some maybe uh, technologies in our back pocket in order to provide enough food for people and also take care of our resources such as water, um, which is basically one of our most finite resources when it comes to food production. Uh, so we had that rising global temperatures, um, and along with scarcity of water, and we're already seeing that in many areas across the United States and, of course, across the world, uh, where water is becoming more scarce. Uh, and it might seem counterintuitive because hydroponics is a system where, or aquaponics or these other ponics, are systems where we're growing food uh, in water. And so you might think, well, it uses a lot of water. But our recirculating systems actually use a lot less water than those in field grown crops. And I'll have a few statistics on that in a minute. Um, hydroponics have been used for decades in hot, dry areas, uh, the Middle East and Israel, uh, those places for, for a very long time. And they're just now becoming more and more popular in the United States and other places. Uh, we also look at hydroponics and aquaponics as a way to produce uh, food in areas closer to um, the populations where they're growing, uh, where people are, are growing in number. 
And so uh, the picture here is uh, some students from Rwanda that I worked with. I had an opportunity to travel to Rwanda in 2019 uh, and then also work with these students who were at UNL uh, in 2019. And when I was in uh, Rwanda, it was very apparent they have lots of people in a very small area. They import most of their food uh, because they just don't have the space to grow it. Uh, these students were very interested in learning about hydroponics uh, so that they could go back and, and maybe even share that knowledge or become hydroponic farmers in Rwanda so that they could take a little bit of land uh, and um, grow food on a larger scale than what was previously possible. And you'll notice that we actually built these systems out of building materials. They aren't fancy hydroponic systems that we purchased. This is gutter and lumber, and I used a, a pump from like you would use in a, a pond or a fountain outdoors. Uh, and those are the, the basic things that we use to build that. And I'll give some basics of, of stuff like that throughout this presentation. Uh, closed hydroponic systems, and I will explain what that is in a bit, use up to 80 to 90% less water than irrigated field crops. So if we are growing uh, leafy greens like lettuce, it takes 90, up to 90% less water to grow that in a hydroponic system than it does to grow that out in a, a raised bed or in a field somewhere. And if we look at those, that population number, you know, we, we have shrinking areas of cropland and areas where we can grow food, not only from climate, but from development. Our cities keep getting bigger. We keep using more and more land uh, for people to build on. Um, the, the cropland needed to uh, feed all of those additional people by 2050 is 70% more than what we have currently. Uh, that's about 593 million hectares. Uh, and if we look at our ability to grow food and grow it near where people live, uh, hydroponics or aquaponics can grow three to 10 times more food in the area that it takes to grow the same food in, in um, uh, a field. So if we have an acre and we had a, a greenhouse, a hydroponics greenhouse that was an acre uh, big, then that greenhouse could grow 10 times, up to 10 times more produce than what can be grown in an acre out in the ground open field. Uh, and then we pair that with 90% less water usage. And so we can see that, yeah, it might not be apparent to us that hydroponics, aquaponics are a conservation method, but they really are. Uh, you know, the one thing where we're, we're working on is electricity usage. Most of these systems uh, require electricity for lighting, for pumping. Uh, but as um, our electricity grid is evolving ever slowly uh, to renewable sources like wind and solar, um, that becomes less and less of a, an issue in terms of conservation. Uh, because we are getting those uh, that source from a renewable source as well. And so we're preserving water. We're getting better at electricity and uh, efficiency and using renewable energy. Uh, and then we also, you know, are producing these things that are very long-term, uh, long-term farming. And so there is a, a way that, that doing these technologies is a way for us to be way more um, conservation-minded and being able to feed more and more people uh, than before. So there are three uh, different systems that I'm going to briefly talk about tonight. Um, and those are the ones that we are on the presentation title. So hydroponics, aeroponics, and aquaponics. Uh, so the term ponics means that we're growing something in water. Uh, hydroponics is where we're basically focusing on the plant. Uh, it is growing in a, a water in a nutrient solution. So basically, we're going to provide all the, the fertilizer for the plant in that water with some sort of uh, like fertilizer that we're adding. We have aquaponics, which is basically we're growing those plants in the water, but instead of adding nutrients to the water, uh, we're actually growing some sort of usually fish or other aquatic livestock. I've seen shrimp. I've seen other things done uh, where we have... Um, them producing nutrients in their waste. So we feed the fish or the, the other aquatic livestock their waste uh, then from the feed that has nutrients in it uh, is processed by bacteria in the system to a source that is usable by the plants. 
Uh, and so there's a, a lot more balance you have to do with that. Uh, and it's also sort of a, as we'll discuss later, a little bit of a trade-off um, because we, we can't really pump the nutrients up to get as fast a growth as we do in hydroponics because if we get way too much nitrogen or other things in that system, it affects the health of the fish. So we sort of play a trade-off. Our plants are going to grow much slower, uh, but we don't have as many uh, inputs in there. And then aeroponics is a, is a version of hydroponics where instead of the roots uh, sitting in uh, water, basically they're sprayed or misted with the, the nutrient solution. Uh, so this uses usually um, more electricity because that almost has to be constant uh, in the spraying of the water, otherwise the roots will dry out. And also um, with several of these systems, um, there's the risk of if there's a power failure, uh, then we don't have the water circulating or spraying, and that can also cause plant issues. Uh, and so we'll talk about some of those pros and cons um, throughout. So as I mentioned, uh, in our ponics, uh, we're providing all of the nutrients of the plant in some sort of water solution because we're not growing in soil. Uh, so if we think about growing in a garden or even growing in a like a, a pot, a container, you know, we're adding some sort of soil that has some sort of nutrients in it. We might be supplementing that with extra fertilizer or compost or manure or something like that. We don't have that opportunity in the ponics uh, because basically um, we're providing everything in the water. Uh, and that includes all the micronutrients that you've never heard of adding as a, a fertilizer, things like molybdenum and zinc uh, and um, sulfur. All of those things have to be in that solution in order for the plants to thrive. So in a hydroponics or, or aeroponics situation, all of those are usually like some sort of fertilizer uh, that you've purchased that you've mixed up. It's some sort of basically chemical fertilizer that you have to, to use. There are some organic sources of that, um, but those can be harder to use because if you have organics in the water, then you get things like mold and, and stuff like that that can create uh, health issues. In our aquaponic system, um, we're feeding the fish and the fish food uh, whatever we're feeding them would have the nutrients in that, and then that is transported onto the plants. So when we're looking at those nutrients, like I said, hydroponics and aeroponics, those nutrients are supplied by a fertilizer blend. We have to provide all of those nutrients and micronutrients um, in, in different levels. Um, the thing about that is we actually have to test our pH and then the salt level in the system basically on a daily basis to make sure that they're balanced um, because those can be become very out of balance in the system as the plants use the, the fertilizer and the, the rates of that change. Uh, also, um, our source water that we're using, if we're using tap water or well water, um, then those already have salts in it and we have to adjust our uh, fertilizer based on that because if we have high salts, high calcium, in the water already, we can't add as much fertilizer or it will damage the plants. Uh, we can also get chemical reactions where some of those uh, nutrients actually come out of solution and aren't available to the plants. Uh, in aquaponics, all those nutrients are supplied by the fish waste and then bacteria that break it down, um, but we have to balance the needs of the fish and the plants. So our plants aren't going to grow as fast, probably not as robust, uh, because we aren't giving them the nutrients uh, that we are in hydroponics. We're just not at that nutrient level. So um, really choosing a system is, is based on the principle, you know, do you want fast plants? Uh, if you're a farmer, you might want fast plants to have a high turnover uh, and to get lots and lots of stuff. If you're um, more wanting to balance that out and not use the fertilizers, then know that you can grow fish. And it can be fish for consumption. Some systems use like tilapia or uh, other uh, basic uh, edible fish. I have a, a tiny 10 gallon aquaponic system in my office that just has a few house plants in it, uh, just as a demonstration model. And my fish of choice uh, are guppies. Uh, they reproduce themselves, so I never have to run out of guppies. Uh, and so we, we have that system set up in my office. So the basic parts of most of these um, systems 
uh, we're going to have some sort of reservoir where the extra nutrient solution or the water uh, goes to when it's not in contact with the plants. Uh, for an aquaculture system, this would be your fish tanks wherever they live. Uh, if it's a hydroponic system, then it's some sort of tank where you might have the, the, the testing and the mixing of the nutrients. Uh, that can be manual where you do it yourself if it's a simple system, uh, but many of the, the newer and fancier systems have um, actual like computer aided equipment that will test and adjust the, the pH and the nutrients um, in real time. Uh, so there's lots of different options there. There's usually some sort of distribution system. So a way that we're going to pump the, the, the water or the nutrient solution from that reservoir into the plant growing platform. And there's different types of platforms that I will talk about uh, here in this uh, presentation. Uh, and then it will return back to the nutrient reservoir. One of the important parts is that um, plant roots actually require oxygen. So either through um, the, the act of this water movement and you get lots of movement and lots of splashing, that, that will introduce oxygen. If that's not enough, many systems will have something like an oxygenation system or even like a for a small system that could be like an aquarium um, air bubbler. Uh, that adds air or oxygen into the system. So there's an open hydroponic system. This is the, the least uh, efficient type of system. This would only be used in hydroponics, um, even though it is the least um, efficient hydroponic system in terms of water use and nutrient use, it is still more efficient than growing field crops. And basically the way this works is you have your water and your nutrient solution it goes through the plant growing platform and then basically it's dumped into a waste container and this is discharged. So it would be like very low level of nutrients in that water that then would be discharged into you know, the water system. Uh, these are becoming less and less common, uh, though they do still exist out there, especially in some older greenhouses like that are producing produce on a large scale to sell. So one of those examples, these are like bags of like a soilless mix with like peat moss or coconut core, uh, which are two inert um, media where it's not soil, it's just those that hold the plant. Uh, these bags lay either on troughs or on the ground. And then there's like little drips of the hydroponic solution that drip onto them. Uh, it sort of filters through the bag, the plant uses it. If there's any extra, uh, it drains to the bottom of the tray which then drains into a basically a drain in the ground uh, at some point. What's more efficient and what we see more often now is a closed system where the, we have the tank and this is either hydroponics or it can be aquaponics. So here's our tank, here's our plant platform where the plants are growing. Uh, it might go into like a little tank at the end and then it's sort of all recirculated and this is where we get that up to 90% water use efficiency because we're using the same water over and over again, uh, where it's not draining out onto the ground, we're not spraying it, irrigating it onto a field. Uh, we're really reusing that water. So these systems um, usually are made for specific plant types. I'll talk about different systems and then I'll share, you know, are they, is this used for hydroponics? Is this used for aquaponics? Um, the one thing that, you know, Many of these you can build yourself out of basic building materials, uh, or you can buy systems already made. And we'll talk about the trade off because usually the DIY systems are much cheaper, but there's labor and there's, you know, you have to use your brain power to manage them. Um, many of the automatic uh, or pre made systems, you know, they're much more expensive, but basically it's like plug and go. And so you have to decide what works best for you. So the simplest method, uh, one that you can actually build at home right now, uh, this method is called the Kratky system. Uh, and this is the simplest hydroponic system uh, ever made. Uh, basically, you have a, a tub, a tank, a bucket, a cup full of water, uh, and you have a plant suspended in top of, uh, of that. And you start off with the water up high so that the roots are emerged, submerged. And then as the plant grows, the roots get longer, you let the water level drop. Because what this does is, remember I said roots require oxygen. So if we kept this full of water, you would have to have some sort of like bubbler in there to keep it oxygenated. 
But by just exposing these roots and keeping the bottom third of the roots uh, in the solution in the water, uh, you can actually create a hydroponic system. So uh, of, of various different sizes. So I'm going to show you a few different types uh, in a bit. So some of these other common systems that I'm going to show you, uh, the nutrient film technology is probably the most commonly used for hydroponics. Uh, it's not usually used for aquaponics because uh, we have little tubes that pump the water around and they get clogged up uh, with uh, the fish waste. Uh, and so basically it goes up to a gutter and then by gravity it feeds through the plants and goes back down into the, 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 the reservoir. So it's just a film of water. The, the roots are just sort of here hanging out. They're not submerged in water. Deep water culture, uh, one of the easier big systems to use. This one is one that is most commonly used with aquaponics. So you will usually have uh, either plants suspended or floating at the top of just a big tank of water. Uh, you have a, a bubbler in there because the water is not moving. It's just a big tub of water. Uh, and then you have it filled all the way up to the top. There's some uh, wick systems where you have uh, wicks going down into the solution and pulling it up into a, a like a, a media that's full light and airy, so you don't have to have you know the aeration going on. And then a few others, this ebb and flow system. This is also used for aquaponics as well as hydroponics. So basically, there's a timed pump. And it will fill up this uh, system, this up here to the top, uh, most of the way. There's usually like a stand pipe. So like the water will only get this high. And then it pumps up. It fills this, this area for maybe five minutes. Then it turns off. Uh, and, you know, it maybe runs every few hours. Uh, so this is used for both hydroponics and aquaponics. Uh, because we don't have the little the little tubes and things uh, that move the water around that don't won't get clogged. Drip system for hydroponics. Uh, this is basically just dripping the solution at the base of every plant and then letting it run down. This would also just be for hydroponics. And then aeroponics, like I said, you're going to be misting or spraying the roots with water. Uh, this is this is the one that is the most likely to fail if you have a power outage, or if these little mist nozzles get clogged, like if the fertilizer salts build up on them. Um, so this most, most people have gotten away from this type of system. And even if you buy a system, like a, a home system that says it's aeroponics, it is likely not. I'll share some examples later on. So probably the one that is the least likely to fail is this deep water culture, because even if the, the power goes off for a day or two, uh, you still have the, the roots submerged in water. Uh, you don't have, you know, you might get a little bit of a uh, situation with lack of oxygen, but that corrects itself pretty easily. So that wick system, you can also build that very easily. Many people even do this for house plants. Uh, so you have, like, you can build it with a cup and a pot or two cups, where you just have a, uh, a wick going down into like a fertilizer solution or something similar to that, it goes up into the pot and it just keeps this plant watered continuously. But since it's not submerged in water, we don't have to worry about the oxygen. You can build this system very simply, uh, very easily, probably right now with things that you have around the home. Uh, this, this wick probably needs to be more of a natural material like cotton, uh, something like that. Um, synthetic won't soak up the water as well. So like, uh, cotton, uh, yarn. Uh, I've even used uh, in a pinch when I didn't have cotton yarn, I've like bought an old or a cheap uh, floor mop and taken the strands off of it and used that because it's usually cotton. And so uh, that's a pretty simple system. Uh, and you can actually build a bigger system like that. So this is, you know, one of those sort of more rugged storage totes. You get some, some inexpensive pots uh, you fill them up with an inert media. This is perlite. It's a, a puffed volcanic rock used commonly in systems like this. It's pretty inexpensive. Um, you cut holes in the lid of this container uh, that just fit the pot. So it's big enough where it won't go all the way through. Um, and then you stick a, a wick in the bottom of it, fill it with perlite, and then stick your plant in there. 
and you basically have a WIC hydroponic system. You would fill this with, with some sort of, of basic hydroponic um, uh, fertilizer that could be something as simple as like one of those like uh, miracle grow type um, solutions. And then uh, you might have to add a little calcium uh, and that can be uh, done in the form of actually like an antacid, like a Tums uh, crushed up. Uh, but our water and most of Nebraska, if that's where you are, is actually very high in calcium already. So even just some like fertilizers, light, very light fertilizer solution, like half strength, not even full strength, uh, would suffice in some, some system like this. You can even go on small scale. We do with this with kids uh, from time to time. Uh, so these are those like uh, meal prep containers, lunchbox containers. Uh, we get these. These are like um, little pots for pond plants. You can order those, you know, online. You can even find them at garden centers that sell pond supplies. Uh, this is an inert media called rock wool. Uh, and you can just stick your seeds in there. We have these little wicks uh, in there. So you can have like even a mini system to, to play around with, especially good if you have kids. Uh, and these are systems that I built and we had at our office. Uh, so this is actually more of that Kratky method. I don't have wicks in here. Uh, basically, the roots just hang down into the solution. So uh, you can build the same system and use it either way, uh, whether or not you use wicks. So I have pots, and this is a, a media called Leka. It's a, an expanded clay pellet uh, that you can use. It's in houseplant shops, garden centers now. And, or you can order it online. Uh, and then you can see the roots just grow down through there and then they go down into that solution. Uh, and uh, it's a pretty simple system to maintain. So I'm gonna go through some of the other systems. Uh, so this is the nutrient film system. Like I said, uh, it recirculates usually through smaller pipes and tubes. So these get blocked easily. Uh, so you'll, you will see this more often used uh, for hydroponics and aquaponics, uh, though some of these systems can be really simply built. You can either buy kits to do this or make it yourself. This is just PVC pipe with holes drilled in it, and then it's connected from end to end with little pipes. Your nutrient reservoir, here we have our storage tote again. Uh, we use a lot of these, uh, and then you can use just like a pond pump. So you would pump, you put this in the reservoir, you would pump the water up into the system, and then you would have a way for it to drain back in and it just recirculates around and around. So some examples of systems that use this. So uh, these are, are examples of systems that you can build. You would use those little pond pots, just stick them in the holes here with your plants in them. Uh, I led a virtual uh, team of folks in Trinidad through building these. They built, uh, they work in extend, uh, a program like Extension and they built these systems uh, in their county extension offices across the state for demonstration. Uh, but very simply, you can have them uh, more vertical to save space. Uh, this is on the left is a kit that just popped up when I searched uh, home NFT hydroponics. On the right, another system that someone built. So you can see here, there's a pump in here. There's a little tube, uh, this black tube that's pumping the water up here. It goes through here pops down all the way through and back down into the tank. Uh, this is a system that was set up at the, the greenhouses at UNL. Uh, so this is a, a, a more you know, involved system. You see these little tubes at the going into this, the end of here. The solution, you, know, you notice it's on an incline. It goes uh, as a film down to here to this big pipe. And then it sort of comes out at the other end and down into the reservoir. And these systems can be as involved as you want. Uh, this is something similar, even though it's vertical, the, the film just basically drips down the inside of the pipe. Uh, and you can uh, buy these systems. There are NFT systems that are already made. They're sort of these thin gutters, uh, but um, you can also make them out of PVC pipe. Here's another, another example. Um, here's a, another example inside of a bucket. So basically, uh, it's dripping in the top of the bucket, and then the extra solution goes down into this pipe. Uh, sometimes a system like this is also called a Dutch bucket. 
or a Beto bucket system. Um, basically, it's just dripping into the root zone, and then the excess goes down into the pipe and back into the, the reservoir there. There's one of our students uh, from Rwanda uh, that did a project with us, and he grew these tomatoes in this bucket system that he sort of developed. Uh, and you can see uh, he's very proud of his tomatoes. Now, you might actually um, get uh, see ads, or if you see, this is an arrow, arrow garden. Um, very common. A lot of people might have these. Uh, they they advertise it as an aeroponic garden, but actually it's a, a vertical NFT system. This is an old model. I actually have a newer one now. I should have taken a new picture. So basically, they they give you these little cups already pre-sown with, with the seeds. And then uh, the water basically is pumped up and at the base, uh, underneath the rim here, there's a little uh, outlet where the water just sort of splashes down onto the, the pellet in there with the, the media and the seed, and then eventually the plant roots. And so uh, these are pretty common. You can get them uh, for like under, you know, the small systems you can get for under a hundred bucks now, the bigger systems, a few hundred bucks. Um, if you're wanting to just buy something pre-made, uh, and that's sort of the trade-off. You can buy stuff that's pre-made, uh, ready to go, and as hydroponics and home hydroponics have become more popular, there are more and more systems out there, and they become very convenient. There's one, you know, some that will, you know, you pay for a subscription, and they, you know, send you uh, the little pods already planted with your plants, and you just stick them in the system, you know, and that can be several hundred or even thousands of dollars, or you can do the DIY systems, which might be a few hundred bucks. Um, you sort of trade off uh, labor versus money. Like, do you do you want to be more involved in the construction and maintenance of your system, uh, or do you need it to be on the the lower end of cost and save money? And so you can sort of play around with each. Here's another deep water culture system. These buckets fill up with water and then they just bubble uh, with with uh, air. Uh, and then here's a small ebb and flow system you can actually buy. So, uh, you know, you could have a bigger tank with fish in it, and then it just pumps water uh, into here for uh, aquaponics uh, versus hydroponics. So here's actually a deep water culture system. So this could be, so this is a hydroponic system just by the tanks here. You don't see any big fish tanks because if this were like a, an actual aquaponic farm, there would be, you know, several hundred gallon tanks full of fish that the water would come from. But basically, the, the water pumps into this and this whole trough is filled with water. And these are actually just like styrofoam rafts that float on top of the water with little holes in them for the plants and those little net pots that we saw for the ponds. Uh, then it'll usually like the water will flow out and go back to the tank to remix. So if this was air or aquaponics, it would be fish tanks that it was going to. If it's hydroponics, it's just the sort of the storage and the, the nutrient mixing tanks. Here's our, our faithful storage tote again. Uh, this is uh, a deep water system uh, with basically this is just air tubing because uh, we have to have either movement or we have to have water bubbling. And so they've created water using, you know, these little uh, sort of air tubes, probably with the little stone that makes it bubble out uh, in each of those tanks. So you can, here's another use of those storage totes. So you can use those in three or four different ways in different hydroponic systems. Or you could use like a piece of styrofoam to float on top of the water. Uh, that's a very simple system to build as well. Now you've seen mostly the whole main systems, but uh, it is becoming more and more common to see these systems, you know, pre-made, ready to go, you just plug it in, it's already ready to go, and you even can pay a subscription uh, to get the plant sent to you, to have an app that monitors it with your, you know, Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. Uh, and so, you know, the system on the left actually was uh, at a, a nonprofit that I visited here uh, this past week. Uh, they named it Audrey Two from Little Shop of Horrors, if you've ever seen that musical or that movie. And this system, they basically get you can either start your own plants or they get the plant starts that you just stick in here. Uh, and there's like a subscription, like a monthly fee that you can get that will send you new plants on a regular schedule. Uh, you can see the costs of some of these systems, you know, that's the cheaper end of that, 
these type of systems, the 400 bucks, uh, 600 bucks, 900 bucks. Uh, if you're doing like the, the storage tote, you might be less than a hundred bucks uh, to, to sort of play with your own system. So you have that trade-off between, you know, the ease and ready to go and you just plug it up versus having to build your system and manage it yourself. So here's some of those, you know, like those buckets I showed you earlier. So it's just a plant suspended in water. This one has this little tube on the side that you can see the water level. Um, but they can just be very simple little systems. Uh, there's my class team uh, from Rwanda once again building that system. Of course, our reservoir at the bottom that holds our nutrient water is our storage tote right there. Uh, and so uh, this is actually an ebb and flow system. So the water pumps up uh, through a, a tube, th these tubes that we're installing here, uh, into the tray. There's a little standpipe here uh, that uh, keeps the water at a certain level and then the excess flows down. And then there was a timer that kicked on every so often just to refresh the water, um, but it didn't have to run continuously. And there it is uh, set up uh, at our office for a demonstration. So you can sort of see uh, how it functions there. So if you're doing a hydroponics, like I said, you're gonna have to do some fertilizer uh, usually you can buy liquid uh, if it's just a small home system. Uh, you can buy a sort of this uh, granular. It will usually come in two different sets uh, because these chemicals don't play well together uh, in concentrated form. They will sort of react and precipitate out and then you don't have all of the chemicals you need. Um, you can even, like I said, use some of those home, like home garden house plant fertilizers like the the miracle Grow type stuff just at a lower level, like half strength. Uh, and if you, uh, you can add uh, that little bit of calcium with tons, but you didn't hear that from me. For hydroponics, you're gonna have to test your pH and what's called electroconductivity. That's a measure of the salts in the water. Uh, you have to test that before you add your fertilizer because you can only go to a certain level. And so you have to base your fertilizer on that. Um, so you have to basically test daily uh, to, to really get that uh, operational. You can do it by hand, uh, or you can uh, get systems where, like if you have those tanks with the nutrients uh, and actually get them to add themselves, uh, there's basically like a controller that measures that for you continuously. Um, now, um, if we're talking aquaponics, uh, like I said, we're going to have to have uh, a few different setups. We're not using the, the nutrients. We're basically um, using fish or some sort of aquatic livestock as and their waste as our nutrient source. So we're going to have tanks of that, that uh, aquatic life, the fish, uh, usually pretty large if we have a large system, but it can be like my little system with a 10-gallon tank and some guppies, if that works best for you. Um, they will be in their own tank. Uh, you've got to feed them. You've got to keep them happy and healthy. You know, sometimes they get sick, they need medicine. Uh, you have to have air for them. So there's usually like some sort of oxygenation going on. Then the water will usually go into a tank where like the excess sediment will drop out. Um, and then it is pumped into what we call a biofilter. Uh, so this is actually somewhere where there's lots of nooks and crannies that bacteria can live in. So it can be that like clay media uh, that I shared earlier, or uh, I even saw a, an aquaponic farm where they use like those uh, plastic uh, like pot scrubbers. Uh, I don't see those as often now, but uh, they would like, they had a whole tank full of those and they would just get encased with like bacterial film uh, so that then the bacteria can break down the nutrients from the waste into a form the plants use. And then that water goes to the plant, 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 plant platform where the plants are growing, and then it will go back into the fish tank after that. Uh, so typically, um, we're not adding uh, fertilizer, so the plants are probably going to grow slower. Uh, we have to balance the, the needs of the plants and the fish a little better uh, to keep them both healthy. Um, you will get a lot of like sediment, even with the sediment tank, you will get like a lot of 
sort of film and sludge in the system. So you'll get sort of that, not, you know, big pieces of waste, but it sort of just settles on everything. Uh, and then we also have to, to make sure we, that doesn't splash up on the produce uh, because uh, that can create uh, health issues with bacteria uh, in either type of system that we have. And then just briefly, um, if you're growing, you're probably gonna need light unless you're outside in the middle of summer uh, or in a greenhouse in the middle of summer, especially if you're indoors, you're gonna need light. The things that we look at, the quality is the color, um, plants, you mostly use red and blue wavelengths of light. So uh, you can see hydroponic systems with fast turnaround where they're just using red and blue LED lights because that's the most efficient uh, and it'll glow purple. Uh, you can use that or you can use like the full white light, especially if you're growing stuff longer term. Intensity is the amount of light that hits the plant, like how close the light is to the plant. Uh, or how bright the sunshine is. And then the quantity is the actual length, like how long is the daylight or how long are the lights on? Uh, so I'm just going to briefly touch on these things. Like I said, red and blue light are what is most likely used by the plants. Uh, so you need either like a full spectrum white light. Uh, LEDs are the most um, efficient. They uh, create more light and produce less heat. Uh, so they're more efficient at this, uh, but you can use fluorescence as well. Uh, so we, we have these colors of lights or you need the full white light spectrum for your plants. Uh, so different light sources, uh, I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but you can do like the, you just use uh, the red and blue and sometimes green LEDs um, just to produce those colors or you use like a white LED maybe with a little bit of a blue tint. Uh, and you can just buy, you can go sort of online and search for plant LED lights and you can find both the just blue and purple version uh, or the, the full white version. I would say if you're gonna grow hydroponically and you're gonna grow stuff very fast because you can grow uh, like lettuce in a hydroponic system in three weeks or microgreens in a week, uh, you can turn those around very fast and you just need those red and blue lights. If you're doing something that's longer term, you need that full light, white, uh, white light just for the overall long-term health of the plant. So if we're looking at energy efficiency, uh, LEDs are in long-term, like not having to buy more lights or produce more lights. LEDs are the way to go. Uh, they used to be way more expensive than fluorescents, but they have gotten way cheaper. Uh, and so those are usually what we are recommending these days. Uh, so our, our intensity basically um, varies by how bright the sunlight is or how close the light source is. Um, so these are all more intensive things uh, we've actually talked about in different types of workshops. The other thing is the light quantity, like how long the light is. Uh, and we use something called the daylight integral. So this is sort of like the strength of light, also the length of light. And so you can see that like Leafy greens and herbs require much less than like the fruiting plants. So um, in terms of like both uh, day length, the, the amount of light and also temperature, uh, leafy greens are much easier to grow. You can grow them much cooler. You can grow them in the winter um, versus the warm season plants like tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, things like that. Take a lot more light, take a lot more higher temperature. Uh, and so are harder to grow, especially for home growers. Uh, there is a website where you can go to see how much daylight integral we get uh, on average. If we had like a, a greenhouse in a cloudy day in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, we can see the different levels per month. Some of these months, we don't have to have uh, supplemental light in order to grow our um, say lettuce, leafy greens, herbs, like February through probably November, we wouldn't need any type of light source on a cloudy day uh, to grow any of those things. We would need a light source for almost uh, any tomato, pepper, cucumber, warm season crop like that. So there's that website. You can go just enter your zip code, your location, and it will tell you uh, your day length integral so you can see if you need supplemental light or not. So I know I sped through all of that. 
uh, very basic overview on a complex topic. Um, so we'll have some questions, but I do want to get your feedback. This is a quick evaluation. Uh, so if you, you can scan uh, the QR code with your device, uh, or you can uh, go to this website, uh, and I will type it in the chat. Uh, and you can just uh, give your feedback. It's like four short questions. Uh, and that helps me plan my future events. Uh, and so you can just go there. Uh, so we can open it up for questions uh, as people uh, take the time to, to go uh, to that website if they so desire. Okay, so the first question we have is, can any of these three ways to grow plants be called organic? So there, um, there has been a lot of controversy on that. There are ways to do uh, aquaponics and hydroponics uh, using organic inputs. So you can actually get uh, fertilizers if you're doing <laughs> organic based fertilizers. Uh, they use like fish emulsion and like liquefied uh, processed manure, stuff like that. Uh, but there's sort of been a fight uh, amongst the folks that that sort of decide what is organic and what is not. There's like a, a national board. Uh, and there's been this argument that since it doesn't include soil, uh, that it can't be organic because one of the principles of organic is soil management. Um, but then you could also argue that we're actually saving soil by, by not killing it up uh, and being able to produce more food. Um, in um, you know a smaller area using less water, um, so I think there has been an approval that some hydroponic and especially aquaponic, like if you're using like an organic fish food source, um, that they can be called organic. Uh, on the home level, that would sort of be like your decision on do you consider it organic or not? Because I mean, if it's just for you, it doesn't have to go through any type of certification. You you sort of grow it to your own comfort level and your liking. The next question is, would fermented plant juice have the right nutrients to use as the fertilizer blend? Uh, probably not, um, because we would need it probably in a much more concentrated form. And we do run into, unless it's processed, like, like I've seen there are organic nutrients, but they're usually like processed in a way to reduce the potential for contamination. So if you are like doing your own fermented things and it has bacteria and stuff in it, introducing those into a hydroponic system can either introduce like salmonella or E. coli pathogens in there that you, you don't realize are in there. Uh, also, uh, if you're adding back something with bacteria and organic untreated organic matter in there, uh, it can actually, um, even create like a, an overload of good bacteria that then forms a film on the system uh, and basically clogs everything up. You'll see like this sludge growing on everything, even if, you know, you don't have fish in the system, even hydroponics, you'll, you'll get like that bacterial film growing on everything. How productive are WIC systems when compared to the other active systems in your illustration? Um, so, I would say they're probably a little less uh, productive because if we're using those systems, it's like pumping the water around, uh, then you're getting much more nutrients to the plant. So they will grow faster, but you have the, the trade-off that, you know, you're not using energy. Uh, you're not uh, sort of, uh, you know, have that infrastructure. So it's sort of like figuring out what works best for you. I would say they still grow pretty fast, faster than, you know, the similar thing that would grow in the field. And then someone, this is more of a comment, not a question. He just said using Keurig pods for seedlings, clean the coffee out in the pods and they work also. Yeah, you could use something like that if you had a wick system, like if you had just a small plant. You know, of course, once the plant gets bigger, you might need a little something bigger. You'd also need, like if you were using it in something like a, 
a nutrient film or something like the to replace the pond basket pot type of thing, you need to have more holes in it for the, the roots to be able to get out because they have to be able to get out of the pot. Okay, and then somebody asked, I currently have an Arrow Garden 9 and a few Kratky jars under my AG lights. I would like to add in a DIY DWC tote. I'd love your suggestions for the light system to use with the standalone DWC. Thank you. Okay. So DWC would be the deep water culture, like where the plants are just sitting in there. Um, so I don't have like a specific brand recommendation, um, but if you look around and you can even find it on like the, you know, I'm not going to name the website, but it's a thing where most people go to buy everything these days. Um, it would be like their square panels uh, or rectangular panels of LEDs. Uh, that can give you like a much better coverage and much uh, brighter amount of light versus you'll you'll see like LEDs that are like in like hanging bars or even like um, you'll see sometimes they're like the ones that you clip on to a system and they'll just be like single bars. You want something that has uh, like more lights per square inch so that you get that that better coverage. Uh, so I would look around for those. And then just look to see, um, you know, is it that red and blue light or, you know, most of them, even like the, the arrow garden, if you look at the light that comes on that, it's white LEDs, but then it has extra red and blue LEDs in it. So it's like a blend. Uh, so I would go for something like that if you can find it. Okay, and real quick before we go to the next question, I'm launching another poll. This is for Conservation Nebraska and AmeriCorps purposes. This is how we maintain funding. So it's just three questions long. If you can just take a quick little second to answer those and we will continue with the question and answers. Um, would you be able to share the presentation with us? I will, and I will actually have a slide uh, coming up after after we do this little survey. I'll share another slide uh, where there will be a way that you can uh, request the the slides from me. Cool. Thank you. And then I have a duck pond, or my duck wand or my duck pond water, sorry, my duck pond water is marvelous as fertilizer. Is there a way to have it, it tested to determine if it would work as fertilizer for my hydro system? Um, you could sort of, you could send it to a lab to see, be tested to see what the nutrient levels are in there. The, the potential issue in there is uh, since you have, uh, like it's open, like a to, to ducks and to any other birds, uh, the potential for contamination for um, salmonella and E. coli. Uh, so um, you would want to, we basically recommend not to use like source water, like um, surface types of water, uh, especially in systems like this where it could splash up on the produce. So that would be the concern I would have. Um, someone just said really enjoyed the presentation and that they learned a lot. What was the material called that he stuck the seeds into? That is called, um, uh, I'm assuming you're you're talking about the, um, it just left my brain. It's too late uh, at night. <laughs> um, it's a, it's a type of, of, uh, fiber. You can either get like peat based ones, uh, or you can get this, this one that is, um, shoot, my brain just like, it, it's sort of like a insulation, like wall insulation type material. It's sort of like a, a spun, spun material like that. And my brain is just fried and it left me. Rock wool. There we go. It finally came. Okay, thank you. And then 
If you're interested in growing fish and herbs in a garage, is that possible? What lights and if interested in colder species for fish? Yes. So colder species for fish, that's why, um, you know, most people go toward tilapia because they can take colder water. You don't have to eat it as much. Um, you don't have to oxygenate it as much. Um, you can look, you know, around for other potential species of fish. Um, you would need to have a light. And like my recommendation, I would go for those banks of like the, the more um, uh, dense LED uh, systems because you will have to have a light system in your, if you're in there. So while we have the next question queuing up, uh, this is the commercial interruption. So this is uh, our conference coming up next weekend, the Local Food and Healthy Farms Conference. It will be in Aurora, uh, Nebraska. Uh, and we do actually have a session on hydroponics that um, one of our professors from UNL will be offering. Uh, if you want to register for that, the registration closes tomorrow. Um, but you can, I, I pop that link in the chat if you want to take a look at that and look at the schedule for that. Uh, and then uh, my last slide, uh, these are ways to get in touch with me. Uh, and if you want uh, the, uh, the presentation slides or if you would like to sign up for some of our urban agriculture or uh, local foods or garden related uh, newsletters, you can either scan this QR code uh, or you can go to uh, this web address, which I will type in the chat. Um, and you can either just ask for the slides and we'll just send you those and not, not sign you up for anything else. Oh, or you can do both or, or either. Uh, so you can, you can go to this website uh, and then we'll email them out either tomorrow or early next week. <laughs>